Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone joining us today. In just a few minutes, we will get started. But first, I want to cover some housekeeping items for today's webinar. Everyone has been muted. If you have a question, please ask it in the question window of the GoToWebinar. We will try to get, it to get to every question either individually or aloud during the Q&A session at the end. Once the presentation begins, sometimes people have issues seeing the slides advance. If that happens to you, just close the webinar, then rejoin. That usually fixes things. We are recording today's session and we'll share the link with you after the webinar. It usually takes about a week for it to be available and posted to YouTube. So we are ready to get started today. We are um, today, Clara Perez, Senior Salesforce Developer is joining us. Over to you. Awesome, thank you very much. Well, thank you again for joining. Um, let's just get into it and get started. Um, the first thing I need to cover with you guys is the forward-looking statement. Um, this slide probably you've, know, you've seen it before, but um, it only remains you not to make purchasing decision based on future functionality. Just make your decision based on what it is available in the platform today, okay? This, this webinar is being recorded. You can follow Salesforce in all their social media accounts and feel free to leave questions, comments, um, using the Twitter handle at Salesforce Dev or join the conversation using hashtag Lightning Platform. So hi again, my name is Clara Ferez and I'm a senior Salesforce developer at Rayway. We are an ISV and consulting partner for Salesforce. And I've been working in the Lightning platform for over seven years now. There are two main things that I really love about Salesforce. The first of which is the community that is basically there 24 seven to help you grow. And the second one is how, is how easy it is to develop in the platform. You can literally wake up at nine o'clock in the morning, grab a brand new client and project and have it deployed by 4 p.m. in their production or. So that's why I am a huge fan of Salesforce. You can follow me in Twitter at Clapper87. Okay, so here's the agenda for today. We are going to cover a lot of topics, both declarative and programmatic, that will help you get started in the platform. We will also see several demos of many features and how to use them. And let me tell you that if you are new to the platform, the best place to start your learning process is at Trailhead. Trailhead is by far the most interactive and fun way to learn about the platform. So head over to trailhead.salesforce.com create your free account and blaze your trail to success. If you are a developer, check out the Bitly Welcome Dev and you will find a trail mix with under four hours approx of great content that you can, that will get you up to speed in all, all, of, all of the topics that we are going to talk today. So the question is, what is the Lightning Platform? And that's a great question to start this webinar with. And I can honestly spend hours talking about what the Lightning Platform is, but since I have a limited amount of time, let me first tell you what the platform is not. So the platform is not the place that you will spend hours and thousands of dollars implementing a hardware infrastructure. You're not going to be slowed down trying to troubleshoot and secure business operation and leave and you are going to have time to you are not going to have um time to develop your app that's not this is that is not salesforce the lightning platform is actually a place where you can focus on building what really matters like your applications your relationship with your customer and ultimately your business and you may be asking, how am I so confident on that? Well, I've experienced that Salesforce has trust and security as their core values. 
And that's why they invest millions on infrastructure and network services. They do the heavy lifting, taking care of um, security services, data redundancy, identity and single sign on and other features. So you as a developer or an admin, you don't have to spend the time and resources to um, build those things. That way you can be focused on building your business and having the tools and data that will make you successful at the tip of your fingers through a web browser window or, or a mobile app. And for me, that's a game changer. So if you're looking for a definition, the Lightning Platform is a secure multi-tenant environment that allows you to create apps really fast for any department. It doesn't matter how easy or complex your business process is. Salesforce help you by taking away the heavy lifting and providing the right tools for you to customize your apps. For example, one of the key things we do when we create our apps is to build a place where we store the data. In Salesforce, we call that place object. If you come from another developing world, you may refer to them as tables. Well, out of the box, there are some objects that are included within Salesforce, like the account, contacts, opportunity, and many more. And these objects are called a standard objects. But the platform also allows you to create your own object to store data that is meaningful to your business processes. So let's start with the first demo. What we're going to do today is a series of steps or demo that will allow us to finish up a recru recruiting app inside of my developer org. And let me give you first a quick tour of what the app is intended to do. So I'm going to switch over to my um, developer account. This is a free edition that you can get um, anytime and you can have as many as you want. Um, and this edition allows you to just jump start and, and, and start trying things out. So this is my recru recruiting app. Um, you guys and, and myself today, we're, help, we're going to help to finish it. Um, this is the recruiting app that we're going to build. Within the app, we have several types of ob objects. One of them is the account, okay? Um, and those accounts, so the account would be someone that is hiring. Um, within those accounts, for example, the Acme account, has um, positions that are open, okay? For instance, we have the Salesforce admin position and Acme Inc. is hiring or, is, or wants to high, ha, hire a Salesforce admin. Each position has a position name, who is the hiring company, a short description, the base salary that, they're, they're, that they are offering, and also they have a status. We also have contacts in the apps and the contacts is basically our database of pos possible candidates or applicants for each position. So if I um, search or change my view to all, I can see all of my um, contacts in the database. So now we understand more or less the two main objects we have, or the three main objects we have accounts, we have positions, and we also have contacts. We need a way um, for contacts to find their dream job. So we need a way to connect a contact with their position. And in some occasions, in some scenarios, we will have that one contact um, might be applying for multiple positions. In order to crea create this link, and, the, and this link is called many-to-many -many relationship, we need a third object. Let me go ahead and show you the schema builder. So I went to my setup menu, and in the quick find, I'm just going to input a schema builder and click right here. 
The Schema Builder is a tool that allows you to see all the objects in your Salesforce instance and how they relate to each other. Let me just have them so they all fit in my screen. In this view, I can see the account and contact object. And I can also see the position and applicant object. Another thing that I can notice at a glance is the relationship between them. The blue lines, they indicate a lookup relationship. And the red lines, they indicate a master detail relationship. The difference between a lookup and a master detail re relationship boils down to ownership, security, and dependency. And if you want to get into the weeds or a little bit dif um, deeper on those topics, go through Trailhead. I'm going to be pointing you at some resources and models that you can do after the webinar, and you'll get all of the information. There's, there are also other features like roll-up summaries that you can only create on a master detail relationship. But besides looking at your object, which is really cool, you can also create new fields and extend the objects. For example, let's create a new master detail relationship that links together a contact right here with an applicant. In order to do that, I'm going to go to the elements right here and drag the master detail relationship onto the applicant. I then get the um, this pop-up window to input the information. Let's call the relationship contact. And this is going to be related to contact, the contact object. And let's leave the other ones as the default value and click Save. Once I do that, you'll see that a master detail relationship or link has been created. And I know it. I know that it was a master detail just by looking at it because it's in red. I can also hover and I get a nice tool tip with the information. So now we have the missing link, right? Now we can link a contact with an application and this object right here that is in the middle between the position and contact is also called a junction object, which, which allows you to have a many-to-many -many relationship. So now, one contact can apply to multiple positions. Let's go ahead and create another type of field. Okay? This time, we're going to create a formula field on the applicant object as well. So I'm going to go to my... Um, left side panel and grab the formula field and just drop it on the applicant object. We're going to call it a start rating. Star rating. And let me kind of explain what this field is going to do. This field is going to display um, like one of out of five stars or five out of out of five star. And the reason that I want to show um, a formula field is because this is kind of a cool field because it allows you to um, display information based on the value of another field of, or a calculation. In this case, let me just copy and paste some code here. And basically, I'm using another field called rating. And based on the value of this field, or of the rating field, I'm going to display an image okay, with a rating. OK, let's go ahead and save this field. And now that we have it here, Let's actually take a look at what we just created. So for this, I'm going to go to my ACME account. And on the related records, I'm going to click on the Salesforce admin. 
Once in the Salesforce admin record, I'm going to go to the related and create a new applicant. The applicant for this one is going to be Astro. And I'm able to specify a, rate, a rating. Since Astro is like the super coolest admin in the whole Salesforce universe, I'm going to assign the rating as five. Let's go ahead and click Save. If I drill into this, I can see that all of the information that I just populated is there. However, the field that we created called start rating is not there. So what we need to do is to modify the page layout of this object. We can do so by, cl by clicking the wrench icon and clicking edit object. A new tab is going to open and then navigate to the page layout and let's edit the page layout. This is a simple way of on how you can reorder the, um, the fields that you see, the sections, and even further more information, like add new buttons, quick actions, and so much more. Again, if you follow the trailhead resources that I'm going to give you at the end of the presentation, it's going to tell you all about it. Right here, I can see that I have my start rating field that I just created. So what I'm going to do is just drag and drop it right below the rating field and click Quick Save. If I go back to the record that I just created and refresh the page, I just see that my star rating is now showing. The cool thing about this is that if I update the rating, so let's say it's actually a three, the formula is going to update automatically. So this is the, the kind of the benefit or, or how powerful formulas are. It's an admin feature that allows you to calculate, to dynamically calculate the value of a field based on another field or calculation. Let's give Astro a five because he really deserves it. Awesome. Let's go back to our presentation. Okay, so as we saw, there are many features that we can use to customize Salesforce, but mostly they fit in two approaches. You can even go, you can ev um, either go the declarative and use the power of your mouth and your keyboard to build on top of the of the platform, just like we just did. Or you can also go programmatic and extend the platform using Apex, Visual Force, Lightning Components, the API, and many more. We are going to see some examples on how to customize the platform in a programmatic way later on. One of the other declarative features that I really like is the process builder. The process builder allows you to execute actions after a record is created or updated and meets certain criteria. You can also use a process builder in other scenarios, but for today, we're only going to focus on when a record changes. Let's say, for example, thinking of our recruiting app, that anytime an applicant is higher, there is a check, there is a checkbox that is set to true. So if I go back to my application right here, we have this higher for position um, checkbox. Um, wouldn't it be nice that if we check this checkbox to true, automatically the related position, which is the Salesforce admin, the status of this position is automatically changed to close. And furthermore, we should be able to populate the contact that got hired with the hiring account information and also the title. So for example, let me just give you a quick, uh, a quick run through, right? So I have the Salesforce admin position and I have an applicant here. I could have many more, many other more, right? But let's say that Astro gets hired for this, this position. Someone will come into the record and edit the field 
and turn this field to true. We also have the Salesforce first admin position that is currently open because no one has had been hired. When we hire Astro, it would be nice to automatically change the status from open to close. And furthermore, if we go into the Astro contact, it would also be nice to know that someone hire Astro, in this case, Acme Inc. So we should populate this information here and also assign Astro the title he was hired for. So we can easily do this with Process Builder. So let's go ahead and start building this. I'm going to go again to the setup. And I'm going to navigate to Process Builder. So in the quick find, I'm going to search for Process Builder. And I'm going to create a new one. The first thing that you want to do is specify the name. Let's call it applicant processes. The API name is going to auto populate for you. And we're going to focus when a record changes. So now we create a kind of the shell, right? Now is, now is the time to actually get to work. Um, the first thing that you want to do is specify um, the object that you want this process builder to listen for changes and what type of changes you want the process builder to listen to. In this case, we're going to be listening for applicants and we want to listen for when a record is created or is edited. Let's go ahead and click Save. Next, you specify a criteria now. Here is where you define when to execute a set of actions. We will set the um, criteria. First, you put the name of the criteria. And then you specify um, the filters that need to be met in order for the actions to execute. So what we're going to do is if the applicant is updated and the higher position is equal to true, then we want to execute a set of actions. One important thing is to click the advance and make sure that the changes or the, the actions only execute when the, rec the, the criteria is met. So when changes are made to the record and, and the criteria is met successfully. So let's go ahead and click Save. The last step would be to configure the actions you want to execute. There's two types of actions. You can have immediate actions. Those are actions that execute right away. Or you can have a schedule actions, which are actions that they execute sometime in the future. It could be an hour from now or one day from now, etc. So let's go ahead and create our first, first action. So the first action that we're going to create is for a record update. And the first thing we want to do is when an applicant is higher, let's go ahead and close the position. So we give our action a name and we select that we want to update a record that is related to the applicant. And in this case, we want to update the position applied to. And then we want to choose one second here. We want to update the position applied to, okay? And then we want to select the field, the status field and change it to close and click save. 
That is our first action. Our second action is to update the contact who won the position. We want to update the, the account related to the contact, and also we want to update his or her title. So let's go again and create a new action. We're going to update records, and let's give a name to our action. We want to select a record, and we want to update the contact. But this time, we need to use, we want to update two things on the contact. One of the things we want to update is, actually, let me just go back and say that I want to update just the contact, okay? And we want to update the contact, the title of the contact, to a reference, which is from the hiring from the applicant, I want to go to the position. When you see these chevrons, it's because you're using the relationship. So I want to go to the applicant, go to the position that the applicant applied to, and finally grab the name of the position. And finally, I want to update the contact account, which is the account ID, to a reference field. And this reference field is going to be from the position applied to, again, I want to know who is the hiring company and grab the ID and put it in the account ID field. So let's go ahead and save. And the last process and I, or, or the last step you need to do, and this is a really important step, is that you have to activate the process. Sometimes we developers or admin, we create the process, we forget to activate them, and then when we go and test it, surprise, it, not, it doesn't work. Well, go ahead, go back and check that you activated your process. So let's go ahead and activate our process. It's going to give you uh, a small pop-up, just confirm on that. And let's try it out. So we have, and just to make sure, we have our applicant record right here. I'm going to go in and hire Astro and click Save. Now, right here, I have the Salesforce admin position. Notice that it's open. Since I just hire someone for this position, because of the process builder we just created, it should be updated to closed. Perfect. And furthermore, the Astro contact, I can see that it already updated with the account, the correct account and the correct title. And as you can see, Process Builder is a very powerful declarative tool that will allow you to extend the platform super easy and most of the time without writing a single line of code. I don't know if you noticed, but when we were creating the immediate action, there were some other types of actions, like creating a shutter pose, executing Apex, um, launching a visual workflow, or, or even launching another process, among others. If you want to learn more about each of those actions, just reference Trailhead, and you should be able to, to get um, a good amount of resources there to start your learning trail. Okay, so back to our presentation. We just saw a demo of the Lightning Process Builder. And now I think it's time to talk about the declarative part of the platform. Um, sometimes it is very easy to extend the platform with um, the declarative functionality. However, they, there will be times when you need to write code to develop complex customization. This is where Apex comes into play. Apex is Salesforce programming languages, is a proprietary langu language, 
specifically designed for the platform. The cool thing about Apex is that it's very similar to Java or other object-oriented languages. But there are a few things that make Apex unique. Like, for example, governor limits, unit test coverage, and data structure awareness, among other things. I really want to give you a quick demo because I think the best way of explaining Apex is actually creating Apex. Um, there's many places where you can create or develop your Apex code, and one of them is the developer console. So let me go back to my org and show you what the developer console is. So the first thing you need to do is launch or click on the wrench icon and then click on Developer Console. So what is the Developer Console? That's a great question. The Developer Console is a feature that allows you um, to do multiple things. One of them, for example, is that you can execute queries on the fly. Right here, I have a query. Hopefully, you can see it. Um, you have several tabs here, but I'm on the Query Editor, and I can type in any query that I want and just click Execute, and it's going to bring me the details of that query. It's going to search and, and retrieve the database records that matches. Another thing that you can do is run a script in the Anonymous console. So for example, I have the debug um, menu right here, and I can open the Execute Anonymous console. And here, I can run Apex code in an ad hoc basis, OK? I can go ahead, for example, and run this line. And using the logs right here, the logs tab, I can double click here and view my debug logs and any other um, type of information regarding my transaction. However, one of the main things you can do is create Apex classes and other type of component. Let's go ahead and, and create an Apex class. To do that, I go to Files and Create New, and just select Apex class. Let's name, let's name this class Applicant Controller. And I'm just going to go ahead and copy and paste some code and run through that with a brief explanation of the code. So this is an Apex class. Let me just format this properly. This is an Apex class, and it's also a controller. Um, Apex is kind of your brain behind your, your face, right? So you have the, the UI, and then you have Apex on the back end um, relating to your database object. Um, this is the outer naval annotation. We are going to be creating a lightning component in a couple minutes. Um, and this is the annotation that allows the method to be access, accessible by lightning components. Then we, as pretty similar to Java or C, we declare our methods. We have a return type. We have the name of the method. We can even um, have parameters into the methods. And right here, this is a SQL query. SQL is um, the language for, for Salesforce that Salesforce created to interact with the database. Um, and something that is very cool about the platform is that it's object aware, right? So you don't have to create a connection to the database, this and that, no. The only thing that you need to do is know the name of your objects, and then you just can plug and play with it in your Apex code. Um, there are other things that make Apex code unique. So for example, governor limits. This prevent you as a developer to consume all of the resources of the platform by placing limits on critical operations, like the numbers of DML. So how many records are, how many, um, records are you inserting or, or updating? The number of SQL issue. The quantity of, of records affected by a single DML, among others. And finally, another thing that um, makes the platform unique is unit testing. Unit testing here is a requirement. Basically, Salesforce requires you to have overall 
of 75% in all of your coverage. So user interfaces. Another thing that you can use the developer console for is to create components, other type of components, like lining components, visual force, uh, visual and visual force pages. So let's go and let's go to the developer console and create a lining component. By the way, just a quick explanation of the class. This is the application controller class. It's going to get the top 10 applicants for a position. So let's go in and create a new lightning component. And the first thing that is going to ask you, ask you is for the name. Let's call it top 10 applicants. And we are also going to select avail available for lightning record pages. When a lightning component is created, there are also eight resource files that are created along with it, okay? Um, each of these files, they serve a different purpose. And today we're only going to focus on the first two. The component resource is the one that we have opened right now. Um, and here is where you define all of your lightning tags or HTML or CSS, for example, inline CSS. I'm going to copy and paste some code again, and I'm going to give you a quick explanation of the most important lines on the code. So this is the code for our component on line one we define the component attribute. We tell the component which Apex class to use with the controller attribute. We also um, tell them which interfaces we want to implement. Right now we're implementing two interfaces. Um, the first one enables this component to be, to be used in a record page and the second one provide us the ID of the record in context. We also can define our attribute tags, and these are very similar to creating member variables in a class. The first that come data tag uses the lightning data service to load a record in memory. And then we just have um, a lot of markup to display the body of our overlining component. There is one interesting tag to point out, and it's the outer handle, handle tag in line five. In this case, we're using this tag to define our first function that gets executed when the component is fully loaded, the C do in it. This function should be defined on the controller resource. So let me save this component right here. Now we save and let me move or create the controller resource right here. Again, I'm just going to go in and copy and paste some code. So here, what I'm doing is that I'm defining um, the do in it function. And let me tell you what I'm doing right here. We specify the, the, component, the controller method that we want to call. So if I go back to my component right here, I'm saying, hey, this component is linked or related to the Apex class called Applicant Controller. Well, the Apic Applicant Controller class defines a method that is called get top 10 applicants. And furthermore, this method is annotated with the Aura enable annotation. And that's why I'm able to reference the method here from the Apex class. So the first line is basically telling the platform that I want to use a class method. 
Then the second thing that we do is that we are setting the parameters that the, we want to pass to the method. In this case, I want to obtain the position ID and pass that as a parameter. And finally, um, we specify the callback. This is the code that is going to execute once our Apex controller finishes processing our requests. This code is going to execute. One final step is enqueuing the action. So right now I'm going to save. And that's how easy to uh, that's how easy it is to create um, a lightning component. Again, let me give you a bring a quick run through um, what we just did. Lightning components are based on a component framework that acts as a middle layer between what the user see and how the user interacts with the UI, and how the, also um, how the application behaves as the at the business logic level. So in the front side or the client side, you use the Lightning tags and the Aura framework, and also the JavaScript resources that we just saw. And on the server side, you use Apex. Now that we have built the Lightning components that we need in our application, let's go ahead and show you how they look. So for this one, I want to go to the Acme. And I want to go to the senior Salesforce developer. I'll go to the related, and I can see it doesn't have any applicants. So I'm just going to go ahead and create a couple of applicants. Let's say that Cody wants this position and also let's create a new one let's say that Einstein also is applying for this position and since Einstein is not really a developer he's more of a artificial intelligence guru let's give him a rating of three Okay, so now we have our data or data set to see our lightning component. So how can we view that lightning component that we just created? We can use the lightning app builder to extend pages using previously built component with our mouse and just by dragging and dropping it into view. And I want to give you a quick demo of the Lightning App Builder. So if I go back to my position um, view right here, my screen, I can go in and click Edit, um, the wrench icon, and then click Edit Page. By doing this, the Lightning App Builder is going to show. This is the Lightning App Builder page configuration, and is uh, what you see is what you get um, editor, and you can just drag and drop the information into this view. You can see that Salesforce being awesome, um, they give you some standard components out of the box, but you can also have your custom component display here. This is the component that we just created, and furthermore, you can install component from the app exchange or um, develop your managed component in another org and deploy to multiple orgs. In this scenario, we just want to drag and drop our top 10 applicants into view. And right here, remember, this is what you see, what you, what you get, um, editor. You are going to see your component display. Let's go ahead and save this screen and then go back. Now I can see, if I navigate to a position, I can immediately see who have applied, who, had, who are the candidates that apply, and a small picture of them, their name, and their rating. 
So at a glance, I have all the information I need in one single screen. Um, further, the, this component can be enhanced so many more. So for example, you can say, well, I want to have the checkbox here or a button here just to click on, on the button and hire the applicant that I consider. Or I want to click on their picture and navigate to their contact record. All of this can be achieved, and that would be great homework for, for you guys. So we, before we go into Q&A, I wanted to spend like two, two, two or three minutes briefly talking about other ways you can integrate um, or extend the Salesforce platform, and that is through APIs. Salesforce offers you a several, several ways to reach out to other platform and services, as well as ways to let other services reach into Salesforce. For example, Salesforce have their standard REST and SOAP API, as well as the, their mobile SDK to build mobile apps. And also, you have platform events for UI um, IoT projects. You can also create your own REST and web services to um, either reach out or let people reach into your Salesforce org. You can also use a combination of Heroku to write your apps in many different languages and show them in the Salesforce um, environment through the, cam through the Canvas and Heroku Connect. So, okay, I know we have covered a lot of ground today. Let me point you to a few resources that will make you um, have a better stand, a starting point and make your trail for success even easier. One of them is the DreamHouse example app. This is a very robust app created to guide you through many declarative and programmatic features on the platform. Another cool resource is the App Exchange. Um, you can visit uh, the App Exchange to get a sense of what other people and companies are building in the platform. And of course, um, you can join the community. The Trailblazer community is like 24 seven there, supporting you and helping you grow. Probably if you ask a question there or in, in the forum, you're going to get a reply within 30, 30 minutes or, or even less. And finally, Trailhead. Again, Trailhead will help you um, with hands-on challenges, tutorials, and step-by-step -step instruction on how to become a very developer or admin. And with that, thank you, and let's do some Q&A. Thank you so much, Clara. We have some great questions, so we'll get those started. Where in the top 10 method were you limiting the query to return just 10? That's a great question. Let's go to the developer console and the um, applicant controller class. So right here, huh, actually I wasn't, that's a great call. So let me just add it in. So I have the limit and I can say limit 10 and save it. So now the component is only showing the top 10 applicant. Great. Um, can the process builder perform data write backs to non Salesforce data sources? That's a great question. Um, I wouldn't say you, you would use a process builder for that because um, process, remember that process builder is, is a feature that is going to get executed after a record in Salesforce is updated in any way. Okay, so it's either created or updated. So if you're trying to perform a write back, so it's a call out, right? The first thing that your system will have to do if you want to use process builder is to have the system update Salesforce, then Salesforce create your process builder for the update. And then on that update, you can use, uh, you can execute Apex to perform a call out. But if you don't have to do any, any update in order for 
the integration to happen if you just want sulfur sending information or or triggering information based on on a button click or something like that it's better to write a lightning component or other type of 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 comp or of resource like a web service or address Kala to do that great um, what are the best practices to reach good code coverage? That's a great question. We talked briefly about um, unit, unit tests being required. And every time you create an Apex, Apex class or a trigger, you also have to write a test class. Some of the best practices are to um, test for single execution positive execution, negative execution, you need to also bulkify tests. So in a transaction, you can only have one record. For example, I can update one candidate or I can up update multiple candidates. So a best practice is also to do bulk testing. Great. Um, is the formula, or excuse me, is the formula syntax specific to Salesforce or is it to SQL, Excel, etc.? Well, it's very similar to Excel, but there are some unique things that Salesforce give you. But if you're like um, used to writing formulas in Excel, you'll find the syntax very similar. Um, let me just navigate to one of the objects. Let's say account, for example, and create a formula field fairly quick to show you um, some of the things. So I'm going to create a formula field and I'm just going to call it test. One of the things that you notice is that you have multiple return type. I'm just going to choose text as an example. And right here you have two editors, right? You have the simple formula and from here you can grab um, fields from the account, from the object you are on. And you have also the advanced formula. And right here you have the function menu that allow, that shows you all of the functions that you can use. If you look through this, you will see that many, they're very similar to the ones offered in Excel. And if you click on it, you also can get some help on the function as well. Great. Um, someone just asked, can we do this using workflow rules? If the answer is yes, how do we decide which tool to use? No, well, that's a good question. So there are um, many declarative features. One of them is Process Builder. Another one is Workflow Rules. Um, I would advise you to always use Process Builder. Process Builder is more of a robust feature. is the is the feature that Salesforce is betting on. Um, it has many more functionality. Um, and you can come in, you can create more complex scenarios with Process Builder. The only, um, the only scenario I would recommend you to use a workflow rule is if you want to send an outbound SOAP message to an endpoint. That's, I think that's the only, right now, that's the only use I would give workflow rules. For all other things, declarative things, I would use a process builder. And we actually have a similar question. I think you've answered what's the difference between process builder and workflows, but what about triggers? What is the difference there? Cool. So triggers, well, the main difference is that process builder is declarative and triggers is um, programmatic. The rule of thumb is that you always want to go with declarative first, and if the declarative feature does not cut it, it's not enough, then you move on to, the, the, on to programmatic. Um, that's one of the, the, the difference. Another difference is that trigger gives you more power, but with, great, with more power comes greater, greater responsibilities. One of the key features is that in a trigger, you can modify records before they are inserted or even before they are updated. With Process Builder, the actions happen after the record is inserted or after they are modified. 
perfect. And how do we push these components to production? Good question. There are many tools available, but um, the more common is a chance set at, or change set. Um, basically, it's a functionality on which you put all of the elements you want to move from your sandbox environment to your production environment. It, it is a very point and clicky functionality, um, but we also have the developer, um, the first setcom ID that allows you to create a, pretty much a deployment change set, or you can also use the ant migration tool. Great, and it looks like we have time for just one more question. Um, besides Process Builder, what other feature can we use to make changes to records when they make when they meet specific criteria? That's a good question. Um, the other functionality you have are workflow rules, but again, I wouldn't recommend that. Um, but you also have triggers. Triggers will also give you the ability to uh, specify um, via code what criteria has to be met and then do some of or, or program code some of the actions you want to happen if the criteria is met. Well, this has been very interesting. I greatly appreciate you joining us today, Clara. And for everyone else, we will get the recording out to you, hopefully within the next week. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, have a good day.